Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The topic of our discussion today is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. What is idiopathic intracranial hypertension? It is a rare condition but more prevalent in the obese woman of childbearing age. It may present for the first time in pregnancy or pre-existing disease tends to worsen during pregnancy. What are the characteristic features of idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Those include generalized non-throbbing headache aggravated by cuffing or straining and associated with diplopia in 38% of the cases, the visual loss in 31% of the cases with papular edema. Additional features of idiopathic intracranial hypertension include nausea and vomiting, back and neck pain, dizziness and tinnitus. What visual changes are there in idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Common signs of idiopathic intracranial hypertension include papular edema, which is optic disc swelling that is caused by increased intracranial pressure. Other changes include visual field defect with enlarged blind spot, reduced visual activity, and reduced color vision along with the sixth nerve palsy. What is the incidence of idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Idiopathic intracranial hypertension has female to male ratio of 8 ratio 1. Its incidence in the woman of childbearing age is about 0.9 per 100,000, which increases to 19.3 per 100,000 in obese women. What is the pathogenesis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension? The pathogenesis of intracranial hypertension remains unclear. It is thought to be caused by disordered CSF dynamic. It is unclear from the evidence as to whether it results from enhanced CSF production at the choroid plexus or restricted CSF drainage at the arachnoid granulation tissue. Now, how to diagnose idiopathic intracranial hypertension? The diagnostic characteristic of idiopathic intracranial hypertension were first postulated by Dandy in 1937 and the theory was later revised by Smith in 1985. So here we have the modified Dandy criteria for idiopathic intracranial hypertension diagnosis. First of all, the symptoms of raised intracranial pressure like headache, tinnitus, visual obscurations, papular edema. Normal neurological examination with exception of sixth nerve palsy. Normal brain scan along with the features of raised intracranial pressure raised lumbar puncture opening pressure of more than 25 centimeter with a normal CSF. Patient is awake and alert. Now we will talk about the lumbar puncture pressure measurement for the diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The lumbar CSF opening pressure should be greater than 250 millimeter of mercury measured with a patient in lateral decubitus position to diagnose idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Next come the role of neuroimaging in the diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Neuroimaging is essential to exclude other causes such as hydrocephalus, mass or structural lesion. A report on diagnostic criteria for idiopathic intracranial hypertension suggested that a CT scan is adequate to exclude hydrocephalus and mass lesion. However, other causes of intracranial hypertension such as venous sinus thrombosis are not detected on an unenhanced CT scan. Further imaging with MRI may be required in such conditions. A prospective study evaluated the use of magnetic resonance venography in women with idiopathic intracranial hypertension and concluded that MRV may be useful in atypical cases of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Now we will talk about the moni monitoring of pregnant women with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Women with idiopathic intracranial hypertension must be monitored closely throughout the pregnancy jointly by multidisciplinary team. So, neurology and ophthalmology review must be undertaken regularly during pregnancy and a review in an obstetric anesthetic clinic is recommended to discuss the implications of analgesia in labor. Growth scans are required for obstetric indications alone. The frequency of visual field testing depends upon the patient's symptoms. If the patient's visual symptoms are stable, the visual field testing may be done every two to three months. How to manage idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Medical treatment options comprise analgesics for headache, diuretics to reduce the CSF production, and dietary modification to aid the weight loss. 
Now we will talk about the surgical options. Current surgical treatment options include optic nerve sheath fenestration and CSF shunting via lumboperitoneal and ventricular peritoneal routes. The subtemporal decompression of the optic nerve can be considered in complex cases. Now we will talk about the therapeutic lumbar puncture. Repeated lumbar puncture is safe and can be done at any time during pregnancy to reduce the CSF opening pressure. Repeated lumbar puncture has been proven to improve the visual symptoms and headache. Now we will discuss the anesthetic implications in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Spinal anesthesia is safe for women with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Epidural anesthesia carries a potential risk of increasing intracranial pressure with a large volume of drug in the epidural space. General anesthesia carries a risk of increasing intracranial pressure with a rapid sequence induction. Next comes the mood of delivery. There is insufficient evidence regarding the safe mood of delivery in women with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. A case series of idiopathic intracranial hypertension in pregnancy has reported more than 50% incidence of term vaginal deliveries. The increase in intracranial pressure that occurs during labor is transient and is not harmful to the mother or baby. A cesarean section is not routinely required. The mode of the delivery needs to be determined by obstetric factors only. Now we will talk about the postpartum implications of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. First of all, breastfeeding. Acetazolamide can be continued during breastfeeding. A review on analgesic and breastfeeding stated that paracetamol and short-term use of NSAIDs are safe to use. Ibuprofen is the drug of choice if long-term use is contemplated. Next comes the role of hormonal contraception. Women with idiopathic intracranial hypertension must be adequately counseled about the benefits and risks of hormonal contraception. There are cases reports associating idiopathic intracranial hypertension and progestogen-only contraceptives. The recommendation is to liaise with neurologist and ophthalmologist regarding progestogen-only contraception. So thank you so much. That was all about idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Subscribe on Obsangani. Allah Hafiz.